Let's talk about development. And development is the phase where your programmers are written, writing code. And we are going to talk about some of the things in Go that makes a developer, uh, it makes it developer friendly, at least in my opinion. One is Go within the channels. And we said, uh, this is uh, the bread and butter of Go. Uh, running services, using all the CPUs, all the cores, this is what Go does best. So uh, we have Go routines and channels. These are making concurrency accessible to your um, developers. Concurrency is never easy, right? Even in Go, it's never easy for us uh, humans to figure out what happens. But the way that Go works with these lightweight Go routines, you can spin 10,000 of them on your uh, laptop. And then you can communicate with channels, uh, which is easier than using locks and other things is great. Go has also the other concurrency primitives that you're familiar with them, um, locks and um, atomic operations and others, but really um, using Go within the channels is, is making concurrency um, easier for me at least uh, to, to grasp and make lesson. And if we're talking about errors, uh, the second bullet talks about one of the most controversial things about Go, which is the error checking. This is what people like to complain about most of the time. In Go, we say that errors are not exceptions, especially in where Go is going or where Go is written to, which is writing services, you're going to get errors. Dealing with the network, dealing with the, uh, the disk, uh, running on, on some uh, VM with some noisy neighbors, the errors are not an exception. They, they are effect of life and you need to deal with it. And Go puts errors up in uh, front and center. And errors are just values. The function can return more than a single argument. And one of them, usually the last one, is going to be an error indicator. And this code, this line of code that if error is not nil, meaning there was some kind of an error, uh, as developer or your developers are going to write a lot. But it's a good thing. Yes, it's more robust than exception handling, I know, but it focus the thinking on errors. And I can see it in my Go code. When I started with Go, suddenly I, I was, actually, sorry, I was uh, frustrated with all this verbosity and why do I need to check an error on every step? But then I saw my programs running and failing way less than uh, other languages. And it's a good thing. So there, there's a lot of discussions in, and you'll see that when you do code reviews in Go, it talks about error handling, and this is great. And again, given that we are most of the time reading code and not writing it, this price of verbosity is not that good. Uh, and if you want fancy error handling, uh, Go now has chaining of errors and you can get, uh, you can check for types of errors and you can do more fine grain error handling in Go. This is all possible, but most of the time, you're just going to check for errors, and this is great. Um, handling resources, right? So an open file, when you open a file, if you forget to close the file, at one point or another, you're going to run out of file descriptors. Every operating system has a limit of the number of open files. And this is why I call it a resource. Resource is something we have a limited amount of. Um, and then, we need to make sure that every time we open a file, for example, we close it. Uh, doing that with uh, try and find it in other languages can be tricky, especially because uh, when we acquire the resource and when we do the releasing of the resource in the finally, uh, tend to be uh, far away. Go has something called a defer, which is really nice. It sits right where you acquire the resource, you defer the release of the resource, and uh, you will get less resource leaking uh, for them. Go is a static language, right? There is a, a static type system that is going to guard you from errors, right? For In Go, for example, you cannot divide uh, an integer with a float. This is not something the compiler will let you, the, the C++ or the C1 will, will happily do that for you. Go does not let you do that. But even though the type system is pretty strict, we have interfaces and we have generics, so we can write functions that actually accept a lot of Right, so we have, for example, the IO reader interface. This is an interface of anything you can read from. 
And iReader uh, is implemented by an open file, by a socket, by an HTTP uh, request, um, and many, many other things. So there is a function called iocopy, which copies from a reader to what we call a writer, that you can use it to copy from a file into a socket or from an HTTP request uh, onto, um, uh, onto something that calculates uh, digital signature by implementing this interface and a lot of other flexibility. And of course, you can do dependency injection that way. Your uh, server struct can have something which is a logger or maybe a, a database connection, and then you can uh, replace the underlying implementation as you want, even though we say that uh, you start with concrete types and you um, write interface only when they uh, present themselves during code. We never start with interface. Interfaces also are pretty unique in Go in the way that we state what we want. So we, we do not say this is a file and it provides uh, read and write and other things. No, we say I'm a function. I want something I can read from. And because of that, interfaces in Go are small. They are uh, the sonnet library. The average interface is less than two. Uh, they're pretty unique. They're very awesome. And in Go 118, we got generics. So we can do even things that we couldn't do with interfaces now uh, with generics. Um, again, making the code even more usable. You can now write uh, generic data structures uh, for example, uh, HashiCorp has a cache, and the cache has a specific type of keys and specific types of the values, and you, you can use that for yourself. Another language feature is the garbage collector. When you have a large enough application, the question about, I allocated some memory, who's going to free it, is not an easy question. And eventually, large enough applications uh, what is known as sometimes as Greenspan's 10th law, are going to implement their own kind of garbage collector. Smart pointers, share pointers, you name it, it is going to help. So Go has a garbage collector. And even though uh, a garbage collector can be slow, the Go one is really good. Uh, the pauses are really minimal. I worked with a company. Uh, we had four microseconds per packet. And we managed to do it with the garbage collector on. So it is very performant, very good garbage collector. And unlike uh, other languages, uh, like a lot of things in Go, it is, uh, has very little uh, knobs that you can turn on. Right? There are basically two things that you can tell the garbage collector to do, but that you don't need to tweak it with a lot of knobs from uh, what is coming. And there was one, and I think in 119, we got another one which is the soft memory limit, but that's about it. Another feature is that Go is safe. It is doing array bounds checking. So every time you access an array out of bounds, it will uh, panic. It will tell you that you're doing something wrong. Um, and like other languages such as C, which would just let you uh, tra traverse the memory as, as far as you want. If you remember the SSH heartbleed bug, that was exactly that. The language is also safe where it defines an unused import or an unused variable as a compilation error. Every time you have a variable that you're not using, it's pretty much a bug. So uh, the language is going uh, to market for you. And, to do. and the language also discouraged uh, misuse of things. So Go has pointers, uh, but we use them to pass things by reference. We don't do pointer arithmetic. We don't say this pointer plus one. This is not something you do. If you really want to, there is a package. It is called unsafe. To tell you every time that you're doing it, that you're doing something which is not safe. Every modern language has a standard library. This is something you came to expect from, um, from uh, modern languages. And Go is no exception in that case. Right. It has a really good standard library. It's not really huge, but anything that you want. And remember, Go, again, it's coming from Google. It is the language for writing services. That's, that's the bread and butter of Go. So in this area, you will find a lot of great things. The NetHTTP package has both HTTP client and a server. 
Uh, in the client, you can do anything you want from the client. You can um, uh, do different uh, method, HTTP methods. You can set headers. You can pass in a body, uh, which again can be something in memory or from a file. And Go is going to do the right thing for you. You can do streaming HTTP. In the server side, <clears throat> again, sending back headers, uh, whatever you want, this is really there. We're going to see a bit of code examples uh, towards the end, not too much. Uh, there is a standard library package for uh, JSON because most servers now, they talk to each other over JSON. Uh, but if you want other serialization formats, uh, protocol buffers and others, you have eight in external uh, libraries, they're all supported. The database SQL package defines an API, standard API for accessing databases and query them, querying them. And then you have a different uh, a set of drivers that are uh, in external uh, packages that implements that interface. Meaning uh, if you're switching from one database to another, the only thing you're switching is just telling the system which driver to use. The rest of the work is, is going to be exactly the same. There's a great IO library for doing input and output. Uh, cryptography, operating system utilities, opening files for reading, writing, appending, deleting files, uh, you name it. Uh, Unicode support from the ground up. Uh, Go is Unicode um, aware of the strings are Unicode. Uh, you can actually write Unicode in the source code. Don't do that, but uh, it is there as well. And many, many, many other ones in the standard library. From my experience, um, th there are good packages. Uh, there's a lot of uh, thought about design of the of the of these packages and, and how they work. Uh, they tend to be um, pretty slim, pretty efficient um, and, and nice to work with. When you are developing with Go, there is one tool that you need to know. This is known as the Go tool. And the Go tool basically does everything you're going to do during development. And we'll talk about production. You see, it's going to also build uh, whatever you want. So one thing is it does the build and the run. So it can build your executable and it can run your executable. And what run does is actually calling build and then running the executable. And it is effective because by design, Go is a language that compiles fast. The way the object files are designed is that you don't need to recursively descend on the dependencies of the dependencies to get all the types. Everything is the top layer and the compiler can be really fast. So click on run on your IDE, it's going to be a second and your code is run. Which means that when you're developing, you can do very small iterations. The code is still in your mind, it's still fresh. You did a small change, you click on run, it's running, right? One of the origin stories uh, of Go is Rob Pike sitting in Google on a C++ project on the third hour of compilation saying there has to be a better. And, and this is baked to the language. And really uh, coming from Python, this felt like, okay, this is also really, really dynamic. Just write out, see what is happening. A lot of time students ask me when I teach, what happens if I do that? I said, uh, I think I know what the answer is, but let's write out. I just write something and click on run and we have an answer. And this is also great for you as developers. There is a built-in test suite in Go. Anything that you want to do with the test suite from unit testing to integration testing uh, and everything in the middle is already there. You can test uh, from inside the package, meaning with access to everything that is internal or uh, Test the package like you're from the outside, only for the public API. Uh, everything is supported there. Apart from there, the test suite also has a data race detector. So you can run your uh, test suite with the data race detector and see if actually you're uh, accessing some kind of a global variable from two go routines. This is also supported by the, uh, the running and the building, but there's a, a, a big enough overhead in runtime and memory consumption that it's not the default. There is also benchmarking and profiler built in. Again, you can run it in the test. Uh, Go is very performance oriented. So 
these two things are there as well. And lately, we also got what is known as fuzzing. Fuzz testing, uh, which is very dominant uh, now in, um, in security, is the idea that uh, the test suite is going to generate random values and throw them at your function. As um, maybe weird as it sounds, this is very effective. Uh, it is finding bugs, especially if you're working with floating points, you're going to find some issues. Pretty sure. Uh, the Go tool can also install things for you and do many, many other things. And the last thing which you're going to feel is the Go uh, FMT command, which formats your code. So the Go FMT formats your code. Every time you write Go code in an ID, such as a Visual Studio code or Goland, and you hit save, it runs this tool on your code and indents it. And we have a saying in the Go uh, community that uh, everybody hates Go FMT and everybody loves it. We hate it because everyone wants something a little bit different than what it does, but we really like it or love it because we don't have these discussions about how to indent code and how to format code Everybody who's writing code is doing it the same way, which also means that for uh, the developer flow, when you are uh, making now a pull request, this pull request is just going to be about the actual changes. It's not going to be about me uh, inventing the code the way I like it and also adding a couple of them. So it's, it's a small thing, but uh, once you get used to it, it's really hard to go back. There is dependency management in Go. So all the packages, uh, pkg.go.dev, this is the place. Go has a decentralized way of hosting packages. So there's no one uh, central location like PyPI for Python or NPM uh, for, for Node. Uh, it gets it with the underlying uh, source control. So this means that uh, if you as a developer already have your Git set up, uh, to access internal Git repositories in your company, getting an, a, a, a package which is internal to your company doesn't require any other additional uh, setup. Git is already good to go. The Go tool is going to use it under the hood and you're good to go. There is the Go.mod, which is uh, the, the, the one that defines a Go module or a Go project, uh, which includes the dependencies including cryptographic signatures and other things. Which brings me to security. The dependency management in Go has security built in. Right, so there's a SumDB for uh, cryptographic signatures of a uh, package that you bring. There are proxies and many, many um, other things. So you can um, pretty much be sure that what is not, what we call a man, um, supply chain uh, attacks, uh, it's not that impossible, but they're harder in the Go ecosystem. Uh, and last is that you can integrate with other tools. So Artifactory and other things, uh, if you want to host the packages on yourself, but most companies, as I said, you can just place the code in Git and you're done serving internal repositories. 